Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Greg Bendian. And if you've been a, a fan of our material, our particular form of optional entertainment, then you will uh, you'll know that we like to speak to interesting guitarists. But I find that the world of guitar after Hendrix has become a universe that is so diverse. And there's, of course, there are key figures and there are people that everybody knows, you know, everybody knows Adrian and everybody knows Fred Frith and everybody knows, you know, who were the first weird guitar players po <laughs> post uh, Hendrix. Yeah. So this is a long way of saying that we have another really fascinating guitarist with us today. Uh, someone that uh, is a, a friend of the show and, and we have so many artists that we work with in common and interests in common. He's a guitarist, he's a composer, he's a producer and a visual artist, which if you've been watching the show, know that we get into that world too. The connection, the, the nexus of the visual and the sonic. And in the case of guys like me and Andy Partridge, synesthesia is a topic that has come up quite a bit so i'm very happy to to be speaking today with my buddy tim motzer is here hi tim hey greg how are you i'm good how are you fantastic it's really great to be talking to you oh nice man to be here. i had the pleasure of hearing tim in october when we both were part of prog stock in rahway new jersey uh tim was performing with uh, Marcus Reuter on touch guitar and Kenny Grahowski drums. And I was just knocked out by the set. I, the world of, wow. of, 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 I don't, is po in some, at some times I thought it was post crimson improv, you know, and I had a group bone structure in LA with GE Stinson, who's a, yeah. another guitar colorist, great, wonderful texturalist. And, you know, that we were in the nexus between, um, you know, 72, 73 crim and uh, and electric miles. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's sort of kind of what we're setting the stage here for. But Tim has so many areas that he works in soundtracks and working with dance. Uh, he's worked with David Sylvian and David Torn, Percy Jones, Kurt Rosenwinkel. So. There's so much to talk about, but Tim, I, you know, I, I, now that I have you here and we can have a moment because we, we had, we had a brief moment at Prague stock where I yeah. said, Hey man, you guys sounded great. And you said, uh, yeah, fan of the show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool running into you backstage right after our set too. So I came off buzzing and you were standing back there, I think getting some coffee. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Greg Bendian. Wow. You know, cause I watch your show like every episode I've been watching it since COVID, I guess, you know, and well, see, that's connection to COVID is that it started because of COVID. Yeah. I think a lot of podcasts did at that time and it was a fascinating time. And then of course this one is still up and running and it's great. Yeah. We're in the high seventies now. Wow. It's amazing. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's two years in August. So we're now over two years. Wow. Um, we went from uh, every week to every other week, just so that my, you know, stalwart producer, Matt Stober, didn't lose his mind. <laughs> but uh, it's not like we don't have plenty of, of interesting musicians to talk to. And, you know, you are part of a world that I, I feel is is that uh, that guitarist, guitar as orchestra, guitar mm. as sound generator, mm. you know, why put a name on it? When, when I think about Derek Bailey, I think he played an instrument. He manipulated strings. Was yeah. he a guitarist? Yes. Was he trying to be a guitarist? I don't, I'm not so sure. Right. So the, so, so this post Hendrix world that I like to talk about. Yeah. You know, that's, that's interesting. So, Tim, tell me about your your early years in getting involved, falling in love with music and the guitar. Um, well, I think um, if I was to think back, uh, I have two two older sisters and a mom 
who was a singer, sang in big bands in 1939, 1940. Um, so there was a lot of jazz in the house growing up. There was a piano in the house. And my two older sisters were both singers and they had folk guitars and they loved Joni Mitchell and they loved, you know, all the folk music of that day. And, and my oldest sister, Mary Lou, loved the Beatles. So we had Rubber Soul and Revolver, like when I was seven, I just remember these records laying around and Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. So I think those four albums in particular just kind of blew me wide open, you know, and, right. and I didn't know what a guitar was until the Beatles, I guess, and my sisters. I, then I started paying attention. Oh, that's a guitar, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and I, I think just from from being around them and then by age 11, um, I had actually a dream where I should learn how to play guitar in my dream. So I woke up and I called my sister, Susan. I said, can I borrow your guitar? And can you show me some chords? And she's like, of course, I only know three chords, but here's the guitar and gave me a Beatles songbook. So it kind of started there. And, you know, as you continue going, um, I'm listening to Black Sabbath. I'm listening to Jimi Hendrix. I'm listening to Led Zeppelin. I'm listening to, and I'm reading Guitar Player Magazine. Sure. You know, early 70s and so i'm reading about all these guys i've never heard of who's john how old are you, Tim? what's that how old are you i'm 62 cool good to know so, so i'm reading about john mclaughlin i'm like who is this guy you know and uh, i went out and got visions of the emerald beyond i guess when i was i don't know what year that came out 75, 75. yeah so i got that record and i remember dropping the needle on it and like looking for the guitar solos i'm like oh wow but I didn't understand the rest of the music yet. And I came back to that record, you know, later, but I was still really deep into Hendrix and Band of Gypsies was really uh, still to this day, one of those records that just blows my mind completely. Oh, it no. always will every listen. Um, I, I just, I, I've I lived in that really, record forever. People don't, I don't understand the people don't get Band of Gypsies, how important it is. Huge. Yeah. Right? <laughs> It's yeah. just an expansion of his world and that it's a live band, that, that they have multiple vocal now, that yeah. they have so much going on. Power of love. Oh, my God. All of it. All of it. And he's got odd meter stuff in there. And yeah. don't forget, Machine Gun, all that stuff. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Can't I say mean, enough I about Band the Gypsies. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> I think about that record, you know, I can still remember being 11 year old me playing it for my friends. Like, come up, you have to hear this and dropping the needle on that. And like in Machine Gun, when he hits that singular note and he's just like, it's just, um, we're, we're really lucky that that was recorded and that we, we all got to hear that up to this point in time, you know? So I think it's shifted so much. In, and you know, in it was suppressed. It was suppressed by his agency and it's suppressed by, I guess, the record execs. They wanted the experience to continue, right? They didn't want the gravy train to stop. Yeah. He was on his way. Think about this, that unit. And then you start adding like Billy Preston. Then you start adding my uh, miles. Yeah. That's where he's headed. He's, he's, yeah. he's met with miles. He's met with black Panthers He's looking to go into that direction. It makes perfect sense for the year. Yeah. And it's it's basically shut down by management. There was no interest or whatever. And we have that recording, which proves, I think, the zenith of, for me. Yeah, I'd agree with that. On every level, right? Yeah. Compositionally. It, it's all there. Performance. Come on. The message, you know. The mantras that are in that music, you know, and still today you listen to it and it's like it gives you strength, I think, you know. It's not the psych world anymore, is it? No. It isn't, right? It's no. that, that's, are you experienced? That's, this is removed now. It's third stone. This is, well, of course, I mean, all of the flights of guitar fancy, but no one before him no one after him but but he gives birth to a culture of guitar and that's kind of one of the things i wanted to talk to you about because you're yeah. old enough to know that you you don't get iomi until you get i don't know what what's before iomi that's heavy that you hear that's a good question um there must Led be Zeppelin. something 
uh led zeppelin well i i see them as contemporaries uh i don't see um let's see zeppelin was 68 but i think they were probably around as earth at that time maybe 68 as well so they i think they were still heavy then so it's coming out of birmingham i guess you know i i think that it, stuff comes in uh, comes out of the north they're products of you know just a really difficult place to be it sounds like and and you know just like um um working in factories and stuff and all the clanging and all the noise in there it just Gosh, makes sense it. makes sense to me anyway <laughs> no i think they've spoken about it yeah certainly you know you don't get right you a heap unless you have mick box and and the north you know you don't there's certain heavy bands that are early heavy yeah if you're heavy by 69 70 it's probably blue cheer is like 66 isn't it i'm not sure about blue cheer i remember That's listening to them but um i don't know too much about them really well bay area okay so it's it's popping up in regions it's never really purely seems to be from one region which speaks to the zeitgeist yeah you know, it speaks to we have electric guitars now what do we what can we do with these? i know you i know? guess you know there were there was um there were things that were were happening with the who as well and and the yard birds you know where they were getting into fuzz and and things like that the yeah, early fact. fuzz but uh i still in my mind i don't think i can think of anything as dark as heavy as sabbath you know when they came out it was like what is this it seemed dangerous at the time although i think whole lot of love also hit me that way you know it's like wow this is a dangerous tune like what's this about what's the atmosphere of that you know it's atmosphere, like atmosphere that's a great word for it yeah i think page was brilliant that way you know like he listened to all those old blues records. And when you go back to, I don't know, it could be anything, Muddy Waters or a 1949 John Lee Hooker record, and you hear the atmosphere of those recordings, you're like, whoa, that's what oh. he was drawing from, I think. And also then as a guy who ends up being a deft producer. Yeah. He's already aware of atmosphere on those recordings and, and reverb and where to put things and where to move things. And, you know, so so you get like the next level. Yeah treatment of that yeah it's amazing think about dazed and confused uh like okay what is that it isn't a lot but it's a kind of a bizarre shifting thing and and there's all sorts of sections and and the, the atmosphere on the original is ridiculous there it is yeah that was that was one of his gifts of course you know and he talked about it in interviews i think too but very important yeah yeah so you know all those all those kind of guys I think uh, shaped me and I I remember getting my first electric guitar which was an Epiphone and some kind of Gretsch tube amp and and you know I played that for a while would turn the tube amp all the way up I'm like why can't I get this to be louder or whatever or, or blow up so I go back to the music store and he goes oh you want one of these the Maestro fuzz tone I said will it make me sound like Black Sabbath he's like oh yeah, this is, this is what you want. And I got that home and I was, it changed everything, the fuzz tone. And it was like, after I got that one box and it was like, oh, wah, wah pedal, you know? And then, you know, you just keep going from there, but you're listening to all these records and wondering how things were done. Cause there was no information at that time, really. <laughs> Very little. There were, there would not have been publications like guitar player, right? Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. They were coming. I, I think I started reading them maybe in 72, something like that. So, yeah, you know, it's. Um, yeah, I think there was there was just so much listening going on. And I also got a tape recorder for a Christmas present one year, and that also changed everything. It was even before I played guitar, you know, the idea of being able to record stuff off the radio or uh, record anything I wanted and be with my friends and make little short stories or skits and you know just being able to work with audio that that introduced me to a world you know kind of and did so you do I, tape manipulation did you do any any gaming around with the, the machinery or, or do splicing what were you, were you how deep not at that time because i was probably only like seven but but i think it had two speeds so we would record things and 
play things back at uh, low speed or faster speed. And I just remember hearing on the Beatles records, like all kinds of weird sounds going on and sped up stuff. And that taught you something, I think, playing with tape. Yes. You know, so all those things, I was like an amalgamation of like, of, of playing with tape recording and then getting to the point of playing electric guitar and just trying to, I, I didn't really know anything. So I was just trying to figure out um, where to go from there, you know, and um, sound was a big part of it, you know, how, how the guitar sounded and listening to records and listening to AM radio and FM radio when that started and FM radio really at that point just was unbelievable because they were playing whole album sides and there was a great radio station in Oxford, Ohio called WOXR and they were playing PFM and they were playing early Floyd and they were playing stuff that like I'm in Ohio. So it's like, there's nothing going on there really. <laughs> so radio you know, really was the thing that was like opening me up to like, wow, what is all this stuff and where can I see this? And then I started reading all these magazines like guitar player. And I remember circus magazine. I remember cream magazine. There might have been another one that I oh, read. That was our 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 lifeline. Cream, it was. Circus. Yes, of circus. course. If you had yeah. them, man, you you read. I cut out the articles and po- put taped into my walls. Me of too. My favorite artists with their pictures. Come on. Yeah, me too. Everybody Bob did. Bob Sandboy. Yeah. Peter. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing uh, what they covered because you had Sabbath and Todd in the same magazine. Exactly. So they, they were in the record Radio library as well. And the magazine together. Yeah. Very important components of, I mean, we're really lucky, I feel like, really? to, to have grown up at that point in time. You know, it would have been cool to be in London in 1967 for five years or something. A little earlier, but still. Or earlier, but, but you know, at, at least we... Uh, we were around at the same time. And, and, you know, there's, there's people today have no concept. Like I, I played take a pebble for someone the other day and, um, and they were like, Oh my God, this is unbelievable tune. I said, this used to be on the radio, you know, and, and, you know, like trilogy that that was on the radio and yes, free was, on the radio. was on the radio here. What's that? NEW had free hand on the radio. All yeah. three uh, songs from the first side were in steady rotation. That's my damage from, from middle school. Exactly. You can actually come home from school and hear Elias of Sun Hello on the radio. <laughs> I'm sorry it happened. You know, like there's, I, I'm not sorry it happened, but it, I'm saying, I'm sorry to those that didn't experience this kind of uh, level. Exactly. Of the guys the, and, and, and gals that were programming for those stations were not yet corporatized yeah so they were musos oh yeah it shows what they you know plus the level was very high and there's a lot going on you say pfm i mean they had nectar on the freaking radio sure yeah oxr and oxford i know they just played everything everything that was coming in from virgin records was on there tangerine dream you know you can go on and on with the the list of artists and all those artists were were spectacular really you know there's i still listen to that stuff you know i still go back to it a tangerine dream come on yeah crazy just pass yeah yeah so i mean we were lucky to be around for that yeah so so that that's my correlated question to that tim is so what's your visual world scene like at that point when i was uh, like Age developing into music and checking out music and what's your what are you checking out visually i don't know that's a good question i i would imagine that um i really started to seek out music and when when things like midnight special would be on or don kirshner's rock concert i would watch that i still remember watching todd he was on um one time with uh utopia and and uh i don't know if it was the recording from the fox theater or not it might have been but it was a live concert and i was sitting at the edge of my bed black and white tv watching this and my my dad walked in he goes what the hell are you watching and he just walked over and turned off the television and i just sat there like wow and he slammed the door because it really it really bothered him to see to see that and to hear that music he didn't understand it so i was in a household where 
I had to sneak my music in, in a way, you know, I had to be like isolated so he wouldn't hear it, you know. Are you he... able to, to think back to what it was that was so confrontational to your dad about? This? Yeah, I think it was just at that time, if you remember, like everybody was conservative, the older folks were conservatives right. and short hair and ties and white shirts. And so you were rebelling. Yeah. And then you you had the Vietnam War going on. You had lots of lots of the hippies were coming around and long hair and people smoking and, you Did know, you have long hair. Uh, not at that time. Not not while I was in his household. You know, it was it was short. Um, but, um, the aesthetic of what I was, uh, going after, I think it really bothered him. I think it worried him because he knew jazz musicians. And I think he just felt like jazz musicians in Hamilton, Ohio, that he knew he's like, oh, it's a rough life. You know, I don't think he wanted me to, to, to go that route at all, you know, but the thing is, is, is my mom was a singer. So I think I got her, her DNA kind of like her, her gift for, improvisation and just be, being able to get to the zone in music and just to go. Um, she could just go for wow, an, really on the piano. She would just like yeah. sit down and start playing and wouldn't stop for an hour or something. What a you know? gift for you, man. It's a huge gift. It's a blessing, you know, <laughs> so, That's unbelievable. I think I think more about that now than I ever did, because I'm starting to understand it more now. You know, like when you're younger, you're just doing it and you're just out there and you're not questioning or or reminiscing. Even, you know, you're just trying to get get somewhere, I guess, you know, <laughs> well, you're, you know, it's I was thinking about this, too, because I had a few compatriots in Teaneck, New Jersey, where I was growing up and discovering free music and discovering free jazz and Eiler and Cecil and all of that. Wow. At the same time, the European stuff is creeping in. So you're finding out about uh, Evan Parker and Derek Bailey and wow. the Oxley. And so, um, and I've told this story before, but in this context, you know, you're able to, since we're able to jump elite from, from area to area, um, so easily, and we have all these options presented to us, we start to form and synthesize our own approach. What am, what am I going to do? And in 1975, I think, or even later, I finally heard Lark's Tongues in Aspect by King Crimson and heard what Jamie Muir was doing. And then I said, who is this guy, Jamie Muir? And he, his gig before Crimson was Music Improvisation Company with Derek Bailey. So it led right you, to that. You leapfrog directly from, well, of course, Crimson was avant-garde at that point. Um, there's, Absolutely. There's no denying Lark's Tongues is an avant-garde prog album, and it includes one of the guys from Derek's Circle, as he did previously with Keith Tippett, when yeah. he had him in the band. Free Improviser, Cat Food Piano, C Cecil Taylor Madness. So you see that connection and and that's then all of a sudden you hear the music improvisation company tim and it's like who's doing what this is noise right and now i'm broken down to noise <laughs> and that and the cage connection and the verez connection which were also uh form fomenting at that time uh in my high school classical thing yeah, I and and then the uh, electronic music. You so, you so you hear Stockhausen. You hear yeah, um, you know Takamitsu. You hear the, you know all these experiments with tape and sound, and then all of a sudden you're blown wide open. You go, well, well now what do I do? <laughs> I now know, I've heard right? it all. That's true. I've heard squeakies and bonkies, and I and and there's their noises that, but their sounds and they're organized. Which Verez said, organized sound. Don't forget. You know, organized sound. Yeah. So when did you get into performing, stretching the boundaries kind of stuff on the guitar? Hmm. Well, I think I started, my first band was in high school and um, we were just playing, you know, probably like Neil Young and Joe Walsh and stuff like that. And I was learning how, like I was asked to be in this band. Um, and I just remember the guy said, his name was Greg too. And he's like, Tim, I want you to be the lead guitar player. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to play lead guitar. He goes, Oh, I'll just show you. Here's this is a blue scale. Just play those notes. 
okay, ready? And we just started playing a tune and he goes, I'll cue you when I want the solo. And then he just pointed at me and that was jumping off. And that was so exhilarating. I still remember that moment. It was like, wow. Um, and then just fast forwarding um, probably to like 79, um, many years later, I started my first, I guess you would call it a progressive rock band and um, really great bass player and a drummer who loved Bill Bruford. And this was in Dayton, Ohio. And by that time, I, I was a bit more, um, um, I think I, I had evolved quite a bit more in terms of like the writing. And this was the first writing project, writing with other people and uh, bringing in ideas or bringing in a whole song and hearing what other people would do to the song. And then we would, we would jam and we'd find these amazing solo spaces. So I think that really started right around then. There were sound experiments as well as pedal boards beginning and drum machines. And we had an 808 and all the, all the Moogs and stuff like that, and tar space pedals. And so we were really experimenting with all that stuff. And I was, I was told by that time, I was totally into McLaughlin and Alan Holdsworth and all those kinds of people and really exploring that brand X and, you know, all the solo Bruford records and um, trying to think what else we were listening to at that time. But UK. yes, yes was in there. UK was in there. Yeah. All that stuff. It was like, that was, that was our, uh, our palette in a way. <laughs> Did you get to see UK? Not initially. I, I missed them their original time, but I saw them on their, their uh, tour with uh, their 40th anniversary tour with Terry Bazio, which was fantastic. It was, it was finally uh, amazing to see John Wetton sing that material and Terry play it. And I saw it in 79 as the opening band for Tall Stormwatch. Oh, yeah, I did see that, actually. I so that, that was that thanks was, for that memory. Yeah. Where you saw a spectrum? Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, you were in Cincy. Wow. Yeah. yeah so that was, you know, Mach 2 is in many ways my favorite because in, in Mach 1, Holdsworth and Bruford are so checked out. And, you know, in my opinion, kind of not into it. Uh, and certainly Holdsworth has said as much. And he looked yeah. like he couldn't care. He was drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette a lot of the time. <laughs> And, you know, just for what that is. But I saw that twice. So, I, you know, again, we're so lucky. We're so lucky. So lucky that that, I mean, Holdsworth is gone now. I know. You can't even believe, for, I, I, I mean, forever we will look up to that guy. You know, it's just forever. like, it's like, what a giant. I, I listened to something or saw a video the other day of him playing and I hadn't seen him play in a little while, you know, on video or anything. And I was just like, wow, look at this guy. Just unbelievable. You know, um, did you see IOU? His the band? band IOU? I don't think so. I think the first time I saw him was with, uh, it was Paul Williams singing. IOU? Yeah. Oh, was that IOU? So Unless it was, it was Road Games. Uh, it might have been Road Games. It was, um, wow, I saw him a bunch at that time. Uh, I think it was, I want to say it was Chad and so Jimmy Johnson. Road Games, yeah. Yeah. So I think that was the first time I saw him. Jeff Berlin. Jeff wasn't in it. It was Jimmy Johnson at that time. Jimmy, yeah. Yeah, which was, wow, it's great. Anyway, the whole place, it was in Dayton, Ohio for that show. And the whole place was floored. Like people couldn't believe what happened. And, and after the show, we like almost the whole audience surrounded him in his dressing room and were crammed in there and asking him questions. It was like, you've never seen people so excited before. And he was apologizing yeah. for his playing the whole time and flipping a latch on his guitar case back and forth. Like he was very, very outwardly um nervous about it but it was so, like it was like um for people to finally get to see him in the united states it was it just blew everybody's mind out yeah i saw the first iou gigs in new york at the bottom line wow and what was that band was that with jeff berlin no so that's the original lineup paul carmichael on bass oh. gary husband 
Paul Williams and Holdsworth. Wow. They they were selling their record themselves. And I have that, the old black. I have that one. Panel. So that's, it was 82. And, uh, you know, just out of high school, for, I guess, first year of college. And, and it was life-changing. Yeah. Yeah, there was so much music back then that, that was new coming in and and it was like listening to harmonies like um the harmonies that alan was working with or eddie jobson it was like wow this is new stuff like new I, area yeah and and then and that eventually can tie you into takamitsu or even just yeah. Debussy, you know and and yeah. so if people haven't seen this i don't mind plugging it but if you search youtube alan holdsworth cutting room uh q a I ask Alan specifically about classical composers and his use, Alan's use of form and Alan's expansion of harmony. And he specifically cites WC and Ravel in this quote. You can hear me wow. asking the question. I didn't know this was being recorded at the time. It was a couple of years before he passed. Wow. Leonardo Pavkovic uh, organized it. Of I'd Jones. love to see that. Yeah. So that that's there. And then I come to find out from Vulo, John Vulo, the Holdsworth scholar, that he was into Ives as well. Wow. Because he I, I interviewed him a couple of times when I, I was in college radio in the early 80s. Um, and, you know, he he told me that he was into Stravinsky. That's what he was was really into. He said at the time he goes, Michael Brecker and Stravinsky. <laughs> that was the that was his two. And, was, and everyone I guess, should know Brecker was also a, a huge Holtzworth aficionado. I'm sure. They had yeah, a like, sexual thing, yeah. They were folding back on each other, you know? Yes, very much so. But, you know, it's it's so wild um, thinking back because there's so much music. And by the time I got into college and was doing college radio, uh, I, I ended up being the jazz director and, and I had this whole library there and 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 eventually became a music director so i was there for three years and programming shows and had my own show and all these records were coming in and that's when i really started getting into ecm records as well and so that showed up so it was kind of like um you had crimson you had you had the ecm stuff you had holdsworth you had all the stuff from the 70s still you're finding thomas dolby uh, and things like that and it's like wow what is all this stuff or yellow magic orchestra or whatever XTC it is or japan yeah japan and david sylvian and and just all of there was so much at that point in time um that was so interesting to check out and it was all kinds of great jazz still happening you know it was uh another amazing time in the 80s although a lot of people say oh the 80s whatever but so no, much great there, stuff there, it was a different certainly a different spirit of things you couldn't yeah. continue really to have the 70s technology changed you know we got into the fair lights and the synclaves and you know all that stuff organization and, became a, a, a primal force in if it's of its own yeah amazing amazing the, the the history of music and we got to kind of ride along with it and be musicians and kind of learn from all this stuff and um yeah i guess things would filter in and and there would be areas that you'd be interested in and, and you'd dive in and explore that stuff but 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 by that time you know i was about ready to move to philly you know um and th those were still formative years like listening to so much and seeing so many concerts and just the, the thrill of being able to go see John Abercrombie and Ralph Towner play in a small club and sit there and go, what, you know, it was like every concert you would see would blow your mind, you know, and somehow inspire you to see all the possibilities of what a musician is. Cause I think that's what I was really doing in college was trying to understand how I could be a musician, you know, because in Ohio, you didn't have the feeling that you could do that. So any, everybody that came through that I got to talk to, I would ask them, you know, how do you do this? And they're like, go to New York. I'm like, okay. You know, so give I was, try, give it a try in New York. Yeah. 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 I was headed to New York, but I, I stopped in Philly first because I had friends here 
and I never made it to New York. So I've just always been here, but you know, I go back and forth now, but, um, you know, I somehow still doing it. So that's cool. Very cool. So circling back to the visuals thing, I'm curious how, how the visual world impacted and, and uh, connected with your sonic world. Um, one thing I, I do remember when I was eight years old, uh, you know, I used to see movies back then and, and my, my sister and brother-in-law would take me to films and they took me to see 2001, a space odyssey. And you and, saw Tony Banks tell that story, right? On yes. Yeah. It's seminal. And we of walked course, out of the theater yeah, yeah. like it was like, you know, an eight year old with my brother in law going like, hey, Ro, what happened? <laughs> what was that? I'd never seen anything like that. The, the end sequence was just unbelievable. And I think something uh, that sequence really affected a lot of people as well as the story was amazing. And um, it's still, that film still stands up, I think. That, and and for me, Planet of the Apes was hearing Jerry Goldsmith's sonic world for that nightmare. And uh, I was five. So, you know, when we talk about film, we talk about six, seven-year-old television, movies. So soundtracks to films, we were watching the movie, we weren't, weren't aware, but we're hearing such amazing music, our whole childhood, uh, commercials. I used to also dig visually, like uh, the beginning of certain television shows, like The Saint or Mission Impossible or whatever, you know, the graphics, the graphics. It's they'd, crazy. They'd pull There's me right in. Possible graphics, right? Yeah, it pulled me right in. And the music was Lalo Schifrin. But, um, you know, I'm just trying to think of some other ones. The, the, um, Secret Agent Man and... Um, Lost in Space. Lost in Space. All those. Uh, um, that had to do something, you know, visually. Like, I, I love graphic design. I love the graphic arts. I love... And, you know, the, the whole, the whole visual thing. I love text. I'm just a junkie for all that stuff, kind of, you know, and, and um, even old signage, you know, that was around, I think affected us. You know, we, we go back, when I go back to Ohio now, and I, if I find a place that hasn't changed since the sixties, it's like, it's mind bending. It really There's is. Something about the shapes of signs and the then the the lettering that they used and things like that. I love all that stuff. Yeah, well, we're up right here by upstate New York, where you have the revolutionary thing. Ah. So the revolutionary area, the taverns from the 1700s, you know, wow, locations from the 1600s, and you just go in there and you freak out. Because I'd love to see that. Yeah, I highly recommend it. I could tell you a few places um Rhinebeck is one of them and, and mm. it's just uh one of the oldest taverns in the country if not the world uh you know they go back and and they didn't change anything so the wood smell is that wood smell there's another film that also i feel somehow changed my life it was it was uh i think it was before 2001 which was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I remember my mom dropping me and my friend off to the cinema like a Sunday afternoon. And we go in there. And uh, the first thing that happened, I think they advertised like a Russ Myers film, like a motorcycle thing. And it was like, whoa, what the hell is this shit? You know, we're seven. We don't know anything, you know? And then we're watching what we thought was a Western, but it was like one of the most mind-bending classics ever. You know, and the soundtrack for that. Morricone. Morricone, yeah. So I think those two films, if I had to point back at a couple, those two were huge. Yeah, and and certainly the atmosphere. And landscape. Of the sound that goes with that landscape. Yeah. That was huge for me. Yeah. And I think for you too. Yeah. So... You've done so many interesting projects, Tim, and I just wanted to touch on a few really interesting collaborations. 
but does it all stem from how you approach the instrument solo? Do you approach the instrument differently in every setting? Like, what, tell me a little bit about the different projects and and how you bring your creativity to it. Uh, yeah, I think they're they're all unique in a sense. There must be some kind of a thread. Um, there is an ethereal thing that I th I think that is is in my playing to some degree that I seem to find it, even if I'm playing a folk tune, I'm always finding a sharp 11 or something in there that puts it slightly out. And, um, but you know, it's like, I'm, th I'm thinking of the David Sylvian project, uh, nine horses, which started out, um, by me meeting Bernd Friedman in ham in Hamburg and, and uh, eventually we did this recording, uh, which was him and Jackie, and he sent me all these tapes here and I, I recorded guitar parts and, you know, it was kind of groove based stuff. And I, I think I'm just, um, I have a way of just finding, I hope what the music needs and whatever that is, you know, um, but it's all improvisational, you know, it's kind of like let's let's go deep diving and for that record for instance i did on some tunes i did 17 takes um and then i realized by the time i was getting down to like takes 14 15 16 i was really in the deep stuff and many times it's the first take but on on that record it was like i really started finding some things that were exciting which is what i was really trying to do and and once you found found that stuff then i was like yeah this is this is getting there so everything's based on improv, whatever it is, and finding the, the atmosphere or the elements that really bring that out. And um, I feel like, you know, like since we're talking about movie soundtracks and stuff, there is a cinematic quality, maybe, you know, that is, that is present in all the projects. Um, so that's some of it. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, well, you know, I mentioned synesthesia earlier. I, you know, I do see the music as it's unfolding. It yeah, creates, it creates a visual for me. Yes, without if I'm not watching a film, so I have a sense of what the lighting is, what the color is, what the textures are. Uh, it's very three dimensional to me now. I I've now created a whole production technique based upon the concept of the three-dimensional mix. That's interesting. I've been talking about spherical music um, because I've had some scenarios like in Bandit 65 with Kurt Rosenwinkel. We've played a couple concerts where um, three-dimensional um, was occurring. Um, and the only way I could describe what was happening on stage was I felt like uh, the whole band was in the, a giant sphere and everybody was was in their their area playing. And it, it was to the point where anyone could do anything they wanted to do. It was all working and there was all kinds of intervallic relationships happening, even if we were in different keys or, or whatever. Um, and everything was beautiful and awesome. It wasn't like it was angry or dissonant, but it was all working. And it was like, we would go back to the hotel after that and listen and, and say, how is this happening? So many times, you know? Um, so I, I think I understand what you mean by three-dimensional music. It's, it's something that is, um, it's a space that it, when you get there, you know, um, that's why you say sphere. I mean, I just, I call it an environment, an but, environment. You know, it's like yeah. whatever is within the environment yes. is in the environment and whatever is without the environment is also clear. Yeah. It's really amazing. And, and I, I, I tend to feel like uh, that prog stock performance might've gotten there too. Um, but yeah. I haven't heard it yet. I don't know, but it just, it was one of those gigs that was, it just felt that way, you know, it was just inside, we got inside of something, you know. And I was excited because, by the way, three is the number. I I, I, I don't know if uh, I ever told you any, uh, I, I we spoke earlier about my work with Derek Bailey. Um, maybe it was on, I don't know if it was before we started, but we did a workshop, Derek and I, I think in Detroit Art Institute, and uh, we, we were, had musicians 
uh, in the audience and we said to them, um, it was uh, five or six of us. And he said, I want you to close your eyes and listen to us play and raise your hand when you can no longer tell how many people are playing. Fair enough, right? So the, the hands all went up at four and five. No hands went up at three. And I just find that interesting because it sort of proves this triadic thing. That's a structure that is so, I don't know, reliable, um, viable, because, you, you know, duo is great. And, I, you know, I did banter duet with, with Derek and you wouldn't add a third person to that because it's its own thing. Yeah. The third person, then it becomes something else. I love trios. I love trios. Yeah, you don't you don't you don't need too much else, really. Everybody gets a little extra space. And when there's a fourth person, everybody gets a little less space. And if you're kind of thinking of that density wise, which we do. Yeah. Like how much space do you want? If you one guy wants to go off, the other two guys can recede very easily. And then you can also get three things going at once pretty heftily. So it's a lot. It's plenty. It's plenty. <laughs> it's a plenty. <laughs> I mean, all of our favorite bands were trios, probably. You know, uh, they might have had a, a lead singer, which or, was the core core trio. Yeah. Genesis ends up down to a trio. <laughs> the trio that was there from pretty much the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, the core. That's funny. Yeah, because in that case, the guitarist is not an integral. He's a he's a ornamental player. Yeah, true. And the right, and yeah. then the uh, the singer is uh, you know the narrative, and certainly a front man, but he's not the whole music. Yeah. And it was really funny just to, on that topic. If you folks haven't seen my Tony Banks interview, I was just so tickled that he said, well, people thought Peter did everything. I don't know why people think singers do everything. <laughs> and it was like, go composer, man. Go, tell him, preach. Tony, Tony Banks is a bad ass. He's oh. amazing. He's, he's unsung in my opinion. You know, as famous as Genesis are or whatever, but it's like, wow. I saw Steve Hackett recently and just hearing uh banks work played so well and and right in the just... musical box with david myers it was like hearing Great. banks played the way banks intended it yeah amazing and just going okay we're in an authentic thing i'd best be authentic here yeah so, so yeah you're right and, and and the constructions of his parts his harmonic world the sense that there could be improvisation when you look at the lamb and there's extended periods of improv. Yeah. Waiting room that they're open to, to so much, but they're also so in control. So you have things like Phil being kind of a loose cannon. He won't play it the same way twice. He's changing vocal harmonies behind Gabriel live that he didn't do the night before he's choosing parts. It's like, the amount of musicality coming out of these guys, it's Amazing. just staggering, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's like for me, it's like I've been I've been working on piano for the last few years. Mm. And uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I, I had pulled out some bank stuff from uh, and then there were three. And I was just looking at chordal structures. That guy's chordal structures are ridiculous. Like how much is in one tune? Like you listen to it. And but but when it's when you sit down to learn and play that you're like, wow, just color, 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 harmony, beautiful melodies. You know, it's just he's he's otherworldly, really. You know, it's like um, glad we know that guy, you know, to have any connection to that stuff was like touching the third rail. Yeah, because you're like, OK, same thing with Holdsworth. It's like, OK, tell me where you're getting it from. Like, tell me, <laughs> yeah. give me a hint of how you touched the third rail that brought you to this level, because you're talking about, you know, 
Sal fountain of Salmasis. Yeah. You're talking about hogweed. You're talking about many too many. You're talking about down and out. You're talking about undertow. You're talking about the, just the list goes on. Oh, uh, burning rope. The ending section of Supper's Ready too, like oh, his, his solo against the 9-8. It's just, it's one of the just highlights of my life. Brilliant. That because yeah, I bet. Myers every night, bang, zoom. And, you know, I got to play it from the Phil, Phil perspective and I got to play it from the double drumming Bruford perspective. And it is remarkable because he's just, he's stalwart going against the 9-8 and then they find places to hook up. But then Phil decides, oh, let's accent nine and leave out one for a minute. <laughs> you know, so like you're fucked, but it's just that feeling of, of course, it's an atmosphere of just tension. Yeah. Then six 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 is the big release. Amazing. Course, the whole ride out brings me to tears every time, except when I was playing it, and I never cried playing it. Wow. So you know, you you go have to shift into another mode to perform it because you're serving the music, you're not experiencing the music in the same way. Yeah. But yeah, Banks, huh? Man. We're so, so lucky to have had him come and talk and, and get into some of the, the deeper stuff because uh, on our Patreon page, there's even a, a, a second part, another hour. Oh, uh, I'd love to see about that. Other stuff. So check out our Patreon. I will. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that you are a guy who's been influenced by so many different worlds to come to your world which also is multifaceted mm. so going back to talking about how you're saying each are kind of situationally dependent um what are you what what was your experience like did you collaborate with uh sylvian or were you sort of a colorist on a project that was sort of sent set forms or what was the, the collaboration process it was an interesting process because I had met Bernd Friedman in Hamburg at Popcom, I think it was 2003. And, and we met and I knew who he was and he had heard me play the night before. And, and I was like, I would really love to collaborate with you sometime. Cause I was listening to his albums, Flanger, which were really cool uh, albums of electronic music. And, and he was like, well, I'm very busy right now, but let's stay in touch. And then, uh, I was touring with Ursula Rucker, the poet at the time, and we came back to Hamburg and we were playing Stadtgarten. And I, I hit Burn Up and I'm like, hey, man, we're in town. Do you want to come by tonight? And he goes, yes. So I put him on the list and he came backstage and we hung and I gave him some CDs. He goes, actually, now would be a great time to collaborate and it will be with, with Yaki. And I'm like, oh, man, this is like a dream come true. So he goes, I will send you some music. So he, he sent me nine files um, that I just basically improvised here in, here in the studio and worked on all these tunes that he had. Um, and I thought it was going to be for uh, a, a, a Secret Rhythms album, uh, which is him and Jackie. That was the, the, what it was going to be. And um, so I, I played all these guitar parts and sent them back. And he hit me back, said, oh, this is great. And then about three weeks later, he sends me an email. It's like David Sylvian was just in Hamburg. And uh, he was looking for material, one to collaborate. So I gave him our music. So he has it. So he took all that music and went and wrote songs on top of it and sent it back to Burnt. And then Burnt mixed it all down and sent it to me and goes, this could be the next record. I think it's going to be a David album. And, and David didn't like his mixes. So then he took the multi-tracks and added his brother on drums and took Jackie out and changed the time signatures on some of the tunes from five to four and, and six to three and stuff like that. Um, really modified the music quite a bit. Oh, that's um, fascinating. Yeah, so there's, there's actually two different records. One didn't get released, but... Um, Big Steve Jansen fan, by the way. Yeah, me too. And and that whole Sylvie in Japan world uh, oh. is always deep into that, you know. But and, even the post stuff where, you know, Rain Tree Crow and Absolutely. And, right. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, the funny thing that happened around that time, 2003 is like, if there was one artist that I wanted to collaborate with, it would have been David Sylvian, oh, me but too. I, I never saw a way of doing that. Right. But this was like the back door, you know, and it's beautiful. And that record still stands. I think, you know, it's, I'm really proud of it. Not just because I'm on it. I think it's just a brilliant album. He's brilliant. I, you yeah. know, I, I would love to have him on this program to talk about what, what he's into. He worked with Derek Bailey. At yeah. Point, you know, that's so, right. That makes so, sense. So far reaching. Yeah. And so emotional and, and so atmospheric and so aware of visual connection to the audio. Yeah, absolutely. All those album covers were always so impressive. Yeah, I think that's another thing. If we were to get back into the visual element of things, all of our albums, our album covers uh, changed our life. That's part of art. That's part of our art upbringing. Just you stare know? at it. Yeah, spent hours with these records. Years. <laughs> no, sacred stuff, man. Yeah, it goes in deep. We uh, This is really, really nice to talk about this because it's like realizing some of these things that have impacted you are from all the things that are around you, you know, um, things you really, really care about music. You know, I've kind of devoted my whole life to music, you know, is, is the realization now. Wow, this is all I've done pretty much 24 seven. But it, it's like it's it's the only thing I want to do, you know, besides painting or, or taking photos and stuff like that. Well, what know? inspires you to paint? Well, it initially started um, because I would get back from tours with Ursula and we, we toured for about 18 years and we'd be gone for a long time. My ears would be shot when I'd get back and I really didn't feel like playing after a tour but I wanted to do something creative. And my neighbor gave me a bunch of paints one time because he was quitting uh, painting and he just wanted to do digital, digital stuff. So he goes, here's all my stuff. And one day I went down and I pulled all his paints out and I just started painting this board. And I, I did this board for about, I still have it. I did, did it for about an hour and all of a sudden it was finished. And I knew it was finished and I was completely buzzed was in the zone the whole time, just like playing guitar. And I'm like, wow, I, I know what this is. I just felt like I knew what it was. Um, and so to me, it was a way to get back to the zone, be creative. But I also feel like um, the kinds of things that I was painting was like the other side of music. You know, the music goes through your ears. This is going through your eyes. And somehow I was trying to get to what I feel with music. You, if you know what I mean, it's like what I hear and, and trying to put that in a canvas or on a piece of wood or a piece of paper or something like that. And um, so it, it, it was a hobby for a while. It was just the in-between state of being a musician. And now it's, it's the kind of thing where I really need to do it to feel good. Like, um, um, I can just go into my studio and, and get some paint and not really thinking about anything. I might just wake up and go in there and just start doing some stuff. And just, just by doing that, I'll feel better. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah. some kind of therapy or something. Of you know? course. And music is the same way now too. You know, these, these have become necessary things that have to happen, you know, and then I'll feel, feel cool. You know, if, if there's something that's bothering me, I can go to either of those things and, and just forget about everything basically and get into something, you know, getting to the zone is key. And it's, it's also like that working with dancers, you know, when, when you can really get deep into a piece, a movement piece, and you're just paying attention to what they're doing and, and the music is flowing out and it's, it's perfectly synchronized with what they're doing. It's like, wow, it's a, it's another kind of a high, I guess, that we get to. I think it's huge. I think it's, it's creating a universe. Yeah. That you can escape to. Yeah. And, and create something beautiful in the doing. Yeah. And, and it, and it affects a lot of people as well who, who get to see that, that stuff or hear it. Mm -hmm. 
So I always feel good about that when there's, you know, if I get, you know, a text or a note from someone that bought a record and like, wow, I really love what this does and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's great. You know, it has to start here. You know, we have to be blown away first or so, so deep into it. The intention, I guess, you know, the intention of it. Um, there's nothing else when there, that, in, that thing is happening, whether you're in the midst of writing a song or improvising or. Well, do you think of improvisation as spontaneous composition? Yeah, I, I do. I like um, I when I when I'm quote unquote jamming, I'm I'm not really trying to just shred or, you know, or or you know, it might be searching, but it's it's usually like trying to, you know, allow the structure to show up and allow the melodies to show up. You know, it starts from some kind of sound bed or something, and then eventually. If you're playing by yourself is one thing, but if you're in a band, there's clues from everybody and all of a sudden something starts taking shape. And it, it's, it's really magical when that happens, I think, you know, and I, I love that. That's the thing that I love doing. That's why I like collaborating so much because I don't know what's going to happen with this chemistry of people. You know, it's like when I play with Kurt, which is a fairly, I would say, you know, playing with Kurt Rosenwinkel, you know, it's like, wow, this is nerve wracking play with this guy, but somehow we, we work, you know, it's maybe we're, how did that come about? Opposite circles. I was out touring with Ursula Rucker once again, and we were in Switzerland in Zurich uh, at a place called, I think it was called Moods. And Kurt lived in Switzerland at that time in Zurich. And he came out to the show because he knew Ursula from the Roots albums. And um, he heard us play. And it was a great show. And I was getting through the audience and trying to get backstage. And he was pulling on the back of my shirt, trying to stop me as I was going through the audience. And he's like, hey, man. And I spun around. And I'm like, hey, how are you? He's like, good. I didn't know who he was. And he's like, uh, that was incredible, man. I said, thanks so much. And uh, I said, I have to get upstairs. And I turned around. He goes, do you know who I am? I'm like, no. He goes, I'm Kurt Rosenwinkel. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know? I'm like, I'll be right back. I have to go upstairs, but I'll be right back. You're going to be here? He's like, yeah. So I went down. This was like 2008, maybe. And went back down. down and I was like, um, we should play. I get this feeling we should play sometime. He goes, yeah, love to do that. So we finally did a session with the drummer, Gintis Janusonis, and um, who was a drummer for Earth as well. And uh, we did a session in my house and it was like, it was like we played for 90 minutes straight. It was just one thing after the next just kept happening. And we were like, wow, this is a band. Mm. You know, that's how it happened. Then we went to Brooklyn, went into a studio and recorded for six hours. And it was just like, okay, we're going to book some tours and, and went from there. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know, it's, uh, you never know what the, uh, what's going to happen with the chemistry you know, and there are people that is like, well, I, I don't know if I would ever, if I could ever play with Wayne Shorter or some mm -hmm. of these people, but you never know because you just have to be yourself, who you are within those situations. I you think just... that's a huge part of, of uh, improvisation is identity. Mm. Um, that you're able to be selfless and also still be uh, a kind of a uh, necessary pillar in any given situation, particularly if you're talking about drums. In my case, uh, you know, I feel that I have the ability to eschew my role or to embrace my role. Uh, R-O-L-E. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and and so, you know, am I a voice or am I a, a bed? Am I, am I moving or am I stable? Those are all interesting improvisational questions, don't you think? Yes. And, and there's something else that I think, going back to your former question about your roles in, in different bands that that kind of brings to my head is, is the idea of you have to be who you are um, 
in every scenario, like as a side person, quote unquote, um, I was never happy with just playing whatever was on the record or, yeah, you know, I didn't mind working out the structure. I didn't mind getting all that. But, but even if I only had a couple bars, once that structure was tight, it was, it was fun to find little things in there. And it's just part of my nature, I think, to um, want to contribute something to any of the music that I'm playing. Maybe it's, it's that thing. I'm just thinking out loud really, you know, but this conversation is, is kind of spurring that along. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I, I wouldn't be so interested, I think, except in certain bands that we love, you know, playing, playing the, the stuff, but I think it's, it's really down to being able to create and to be who you are within that stuff. Like with Ursula, one of the things that is, I always loved about the band is we had her songs, we had her pieces and they were, they, they had arrangements and structures, but they were loose and she didn't want to do them the same time every, uh, the same way every night. Neither did I, you know, so we could play them at different tempos, you know, it would depend on the night and the mood of the place we were in, you know, and, um, this is a really interesting aspect of what I call structured improvisation or wow. improvisational song structure, where th you mentioned the variation of tempo thing. And I'm here to tell everyone that when I was in the Cecil Taylor trio, material could be played fast or slow. Yeah. And it depended on how he wanted it at that moment. He was the catalyst. He was the group, the musical director Mm. But he was playing that material differently every time and and could be really short or could be really long. So exactly. So yes. that three dimensional thing gets going again and just kind of go when you experience a band like that. Oh, we're do that's how we're dealing. Yeah. You go forward from that. That's in your in your, you know, quill. You have like whatever you need. You, you, you go. I can do that, whatever works for the material, whatever works for me at that day. Yeah. And you know, it's like how short or long the piece is, like on nights where that stuff is flying, you keep going. Like Ursula is amazing and she would, she'd be on her roll and it'd be just flying. She's like uh, John Coltrane of poetry or something, just unbelievable. And, and we would just keep going and going and going. And then you would feel you would feel the end coming. You of could course. feel it coming. And all of a sudden it would just be the perfect ending. Yep. Not perfect, but perfect, you know. And well, the ending that's sort of a, a group a congress of yes, you know, what how this is going to end, what's the best way. Yeah. Everybody's making these last minute decisions and choices. And it's yes. incredible. It is. Yeah. So yeah, all of that. All of that. Um, um, yeah, I'm just how you get from it. This is another big thing that that I talk with Alex Klein about, my buddy who who's done it all. You know, getting from improvs into material and getting out of material into improvs and having material over and under improvs and and so all the stratagem. Oh, know, that's awesome. Yeah, that that's something that that's a, an arranging world, but it's also that plasticity thing. Yeah. Uh, can we do it? Can you do a short improv that makes sense? And in Interzone was doing this all the time with Nels Klein. You know, really, we'll do a short improv here, but it's not the main improv. And then we're going to this material and that's the main material. And then we'll go to a main improv. Like all of those strategies that you can employ. That's great. To keep space, control of, of shape, form, micro, macro. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. Well, everything I did with Nels was was another was like my first hand of guitar electronica world uh, pedal manipulation writing for it. I would request certain sounds that he had. What for, year was this? This is uh, the first Inters on record is ninety six, dedicated what? to Gentle Giant, and then uh, Myriad was uh 99 and then jack kirby was 2001 i have to hear those yeah 
And Requiem for Jack Kirby has been remastered and all of the original Kirby artwork is available uh, with the download on my Bandcamp. Um, it's kind of my most popular pr project because it brings the visual world into the, the comic uh, book world, into the music jazz world, improv world, s sound texture world, uh, collision head on and with the help of the comic book industry because that was the world that had visually impacted my that's awesome world you know very early you know listening to like like children uh i remember me no fear jan hammer and reading uh mm. avengers and spider-man and cosmic stuff too like warlock so yeah you know the 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 guitar as orchestra thing. And so that was the thing is I was always orchestrating as we do. And as you know, guys you're working with will do. Yeah. you They're there because they can orchestrate. They're there because they know when to not play. They're there because they know what to play when they need to play. And I don't even know what, how that is, but in the case, this, so here's one thing is like you and I listen to the same records. Nels and Alice and I listen to all the same records. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you talk about the ECM thing and you talk about like their knowledge of the ECM thing is just off the charts, way beyond mine, because that, that, that world is gigantic anyway. And Nels but, worked a record store for years, too. So he, he was at my house like a few years ago and I have this whole wall of vinyl. And as soon as he walked in, he goes, oh, one of my favorite albums. He just pointed at all the covers, you know, and, and it was like just a whole you know, a whole connection right there was great. Of course, because the ECM Same. thing, you know, Terry Ripdahl, mm. a Terry Ripdahl Vetus Dijonette record. Yes. Life changing. All of those. First song. There's, there's so many. Yeah. So what's going on these days, Tim? What a massive world of music. Well, there's always stuff going on. Um, just released on Moon June, uh, Bleed, which is from Reuter Matzer Grohowski, that just came out. Um, just put out a new album on my label, 1K, called um, The Crossing. And it's by my power trio called Orion Tango. Um, I'm working on a film soundtrack at the moment uh, called Swerve. And I'm really enjoying that. It just seems like such a natural place to be doing soundtracks i mean i love that and it's you know from working with dance as many years as i've been doing you know working with movement and all that i mean soundtracks and finding that thing it's a it's a it's a natural place for me to go to mm -hmm. so i hope to do more of that that kind of work um yeah i'm writing a lot always down here in the studio recording improvs and um, songwriting with a new duo called shadow duo and it's a songwriting project uh, and uh, that's been a magical thing too uh, mimi parker just died uh, unfortunately from low and i really loved low and um the, the day we heard we heard about that, uh, there there was a song that just kind of popped out of the ether, and we're calling it Mimi. And but my my older sister uh, Mary Lou had also passed away a few years ago, and her her nickname was Mimi. So this the song kind of has dual dual meanings to me, and it's very deep and beautiful and heavy and bittersweet, and has an atmosphere to it. So I, I'm really enjoying that kind of project too, like starting with acoustic guitars and tunings and working that way, you know, uh, with atmosphere and vocals. Um, what else is going on? Uh, there's going to be a new packed album uh, next year with Percy Jones. With Percy Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Skolnick, also Kenny Grahowski on that. We, we did a recording this year um, and uh, it just got set aside because of, Kenny and Alex's tour dates with all their bands. Um, so we'll, we'll be touring, I guess, in February or March beginning and probably do some stuff next year. So that'll, that'll be coming out. And um, I don't know if there's anything else. We're going to record some more with Bandit 65 in February. So there, it just seems like there's always stuff happening. And I look forward to playing live more 
you know, I really yeah. miss playing within the context of a band. It felt so good to play with Marcus and Kenny at the Prague stock. That was just a high point of this year for me. That just felt so great. Um, Prague so stock was a high point of the year for me as well. Playing. That was great. That was like seeing you play Tarkas was pretty, pretty astounding actually. You know, her set actually, um, we were all crying during the whole set. It was a beautiful set. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. People were reacting strongly to it. It was very profound. All her material, all of her original material. Well, that was the thing is I wanted to, to as music director, showcase her areas. And so the acoustic beginning with her singing beautiful greg's favorite for greg lake that's the beginning of it like that's where it starts and and fernando perdomo was just such a fast amazing you know collaborator for he's amazing thing you know amazing so that and then then having the electric fusion blowing thing and then having the prog epic thing for for the darkness yeah then you can have tarkas then tarkas is a party it was a party with Mike Keneally blowing on that, which was really amazing. I loved hearing his interpretations. Yeah, Mike. Mike's a, a pleasure, but the, his knowledge of Tarkas, just the, the, being in a room with that many people that know the micro details of Tarkas versions, <laughs> multiple versions. So how does that version, how do they get out of that section? I mean, just that idea of, well, look, I did the Mahavishnu stuff. I did the Genesis stuff. I do the Todd stuff. I've never done the ELP stuff because there are no keyboardists available. So you're not going to cover ELP. That's then you right. can play with Rachel Flowers. Rachel's. Wow. So that was mind blowing. Yeah. Because uh, a highlight to work with a musician of that level who's going to play flute and sing and play piano and play synths and play killer Hammond organ. I mean, don't get me started on Hammond organ. I mean, that's oh. as an instrument. So you have the real thing. And so, you know, shout out to Rachel Flowers and, you know, her mom, Jeannie, for for making that happen, because it absolutely, was, you know, Keneally was a huge force in it and 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 Perdomo, too. So was was uh, the Hammond that she used? Was that one of Keith's by chance? No, it was a, a rental, but it had a Leslie and she's doing the bars and, you know, it's she's playing that organ and there's no nothing like it. It was but, phenomenal. But, you know, I don't know if you caught what happened. Um, the, the first gong hit blew out all my monitors and all I could hear was the gong decay. Cause I hit it too hard and it was right behind me and it's miked for fuck's sake. So I, I, it's like, I hit the gong and, you know, I put the beater down and I'm ready to play. And I realized her fingers have started moving and I, and I'm like, I missed a bar. <laughs> the gong just overtook all sound. So I remember that moment. I was wondering what happened. Oh my God. It was so brutal because we didn't sound check the gong. Oh, we, it's like always the last thing you would think of. We didn't sound check the gong. Well, the gong was in every mic. It was gong was in the Leslie mic. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So gongs are loud folks. And Carl had it much further back than I did. Yeah. So it was great to hear you though in that setting. And, and Kenny's so great. And He's so Marcus great. Is so great. And it's just a great trio. Um, and I, the whole time I was talking uh, to Mike about just how this was an intersection of so many of our favorite worlds and how, how did this become its own thing when you're thinking about, you know, the origins of group improvs and what they're going to do and what, what rhythmic component will be in it, you know, because yeah. I always had this thing about the New York LA thing where they're much more open to different rhythmic stuff grooves and such in the la scene than they were in the new york scene oh ah. because i was playing with guy, you know guys like cecil and guys like Derek, who i think was part of the new york scene for a while that's how i ended up playing with him is he was in new york a lot playing with zorn and and different people and doing company so i ended up doing company with him and george wow. lewis and leo smith and robert dick and and so 
the so he was very much a New York presence, but it wasn't about rhythmic um, periodicity, as Zanakis would say. It was it was more about like breaking up rhythm all the time or multiple rhythms. Derek mm. would say, don't play with me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's something interesting, in, like in certain musical situations, the drummer wants to get on top of various people's lines or vice versa, you know, um, because there is that thing going back and forth. But it, it gets really interesting when you're playing in different worlds, so to speak, but it's all yeah, it's one option to go with. And it's yeah. many more options after that. Yeah. yeah. So Tim, uh, this has been such a pleasure to chat with you and, and, and get into some details. Yeah. I'm just um, so, so happy that, that we, we dug a little deeper and, uh, tell people your website. Uh, there's a couple websites. There's Tim mm -hmm. uh, which you'll find a lot of info about what's going on and the past projects. And you can also go to one K recordings.bandcamp.com. And that's where my catalog is. There's about 62 releases there currently more coming. And, um, also my, a lot of my artwork shows up, um, that's available for sale, um, through the merch portal of 1k recordings. Um, you can also find me on in Instagram and Facebook. So all those places. Yes. Look for Tim everywhere and find him his, his playing on YouTube because uh, it's fascinating to watch him play and mm. to sort of wonder what's going on and, and how, how is he achieving these sounds? And it's just a pleasure to, to speak with you, Tim, and to listen to you. Thank you for doing the show. Everybody, this has been the broadcast. My, my guest has been Tim Mosser, the sound painter. And, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really great. Everybody, see you next time.